The session is for journalists, communication professionals and allies who want to understand more about the UN Convention on the Rights of Disabled People, the monitoring process and how you can report on it. Um, so we'll be going out to Ginny for next week and all the help that we can have in amplifying the work of our delegation and to raise awareness about the issues impacting on disabled people is um, really, really important for us. Um, we do ask that you don't share anything confidential today. It's, it's an open session that's being recorded. Um, we want this to be a safe space where everyone feels comfortable to participate but we won't be able to discuss individual casework or provide any legal advice. So if you're an NUJ member and you're experiencing discrimination or difficulties securing reasonable adjustments at work, you can get in touch with a rep or an official and we can sign post you if you need that. Um, and we have some members of the Deaf and Disabled Peoples um, Organization Coalition. Um, and if you would like to share your um, social media handles or contact details for journalists to get in touch with you, then please feel free to do so in the chat. But we will also send out some links and resources after the meeting. So that is enough from me. And I'm going to hand over to Ellen. Um, so um, please, please go ahead. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks, Natasha. Um, and with me, I think people have already noticed um, Elsa. Elsa's the only cat you'll see today. The others have been kicked out because they're too noisy. Um, I want to start by thanking Natasha and Anne for organising this session. It's really important to deaf and disabled people that more is known about the Convention on the Rights of Disabled People. It has a huge importance among deaf and disabled people across the UK. And one of the things I hear from disabled people all the time is how the media never reflects our issues or talks about us. Disabled people are often in the media, but I think something we'll get onto later in, in the conversation is that we often feel that the betrayals um, don't fit with a, a progressive idea of, of disability and that the things that are actually important to us aren't included. And the convention's really important. It was, I'm gonna start with just some of the, the background and understanding of, of the convention and, and how it works. So it's an international United Nations human rights treaty. And the text of the convention was adopted in 2006. And one of the things that's really special to deaf and disabled people about the convention is that the wording was put together by disabled campaigners themselves. So, so it came from us and it sets out a really recording in progress. What we tend to call a gold standard for equality Equal. and inclusion. Um, some of the articles in there, there are 33 in total, are for immediate implementation. Um, those are ones around equality and discrimination. And some of those are for what we call progressive implementation. So the articles set out a vision, a long term vision for how disabled people want society to be while recognizing that many societies will be several steps away from that. And it's about working towards those. The convention is in line with a human rights model of disability. And that is consistent with something called the social model of disability, which some of you may have heard of. It's a way of looking at and understanding disability, which is used within the UK. It is unanimously adopted across charities, as well as deaf and disabled people's organisations. So deaf and disabled people's organisations are ones that are run and controlled by, by us. Mm, the, the, the big charities, the ones that are household names, aren't user led. And there does, uh, there is a history of tension between charities and DDPOs. We as disabled activists feel that anything to do with disability, people should be talking to us. It shouldn't be a case of talking about us without us. The convention, 
the the language that you'll find on the I always get the <laughs> this is quite good the office of the High Commissioner on Human Rights I think it is that's where all the UN treaties uh, are housed on their website. Uh, the convention is actually called the Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities. That isn't social model language. The Disability Committee has given us in the UK permission to use our own language. The social model uh, deliberately talks about disabled people rather than people with disabilities. And that's something that's really, really important to us and really important to us across the board. I think I think all charities now use disabled people um, as a terminology as well. But we find that the media, like the general public, sort of lags behind um, and isn't always sure of the terminology to use. It's definitely the correct thing to do to talk about disabled people, not people with disabilities. So according to the social model, our understanding is that there is a difference between, on the one hand, the impairments or illnesses or differences that we have and disability on the other, where disability refers to a layer of oppression that we experience on top of our impairments and differences. We are literally disabled by society. We see disability as a form of oppression, hence we talk about being disabled people. There's a huge range of hundreds, thousands of different kinds of conditions and impairments and illnesses and, and just differences that we all have. But what unites us as a movement is our shared experience of oppression. And that's the umbrella we come under to campaign for social justice and improvements in our lives. When people, disabled people first discover the social model, we talk about a light bulb moment when we kind of realize that the problem isn't us, the problem is society. And it allows us to throw off, you know, a lifetime of internalized oppression. And it makes complete sense to, to people who've lived with this form of oppression that the biggest barriers we face aren't the pain or distress we're in often it's the it's the added discrimination and oppression that we face so we unite under that and the social model is in line with the human rights approach so um that makes the con convention i guess even more important within a uk context because the disabled people's movement and our organizations are all built around fighting for the social model and for a better understanding and approach towards disability. Here, the UK government finally ratified the convention in 2009. That was a, a new Labour government. Um, I think people felt at the time we did have lots of opportunities to speak to government at that time. It didn't wasn't necessarily reflected in action, but there was lots of talking around the table. But it did take a lot of effort to get them to ratify it, actually. And there are three reservations and one interpretive declaration that the UK still has. So those are things where the, the state party is saying, actually, we're not signed up to all of this. What the UK government is not fully signed up to in the convention is, one, is uh, both the reservation and the interpretive declaration are on Article 24 and the right to inclusive education. The UK government says they think there should be choice to enable families to send children to special schools. Um, that's something that the disabled people's movement disagrees with. Um, there's a reservation around employment in the armed forces. So um, the, the government is saying there that they have a right to discriminate against disabled people in terms of who can uh, work in the armed forces. And then there's also a reservation on Article 18, which is around um, freedom of movement. And that's about restricting the rights of people who are claiming asylum who are disabled. Nice. So those are the things that, that our state party isn't fully signed up to. Um, as I said before, there are certain articles which cover non-discrimination and equality 
and the idea is that those are for immediate implementation. Then there are articles around social, economic and cultural rights, and those are for progressive implementation um, as far as um, the resources allow. And it says that it says that state parties who were signed up to the convention must use their resources as far as they possibly can, must use maximum resources to try and progress towards this high level vision of equality and inclusion. And there are other articles around monitoring, engagement and data collection. The UK is also signed up to something called the optional protocol. And that means that the UK, by signing that, the UK government was saying that they allow the UN Disability Committee to take complaints and investigate where there are alleged breaches of the convention. To use that, you have to have exhausted domestic remedies. Because the convention isn't enshrined in domestic legislation, there isn't really anything that the committee can do about a breach, but it isn't considered, uh, it's considered shameful, I suppose, is, is the most um, that, that comes from that, but there is a, a bearing for that. Um, there are different views around how far the convention, being something that the UK government is signed up to, is taken into account in interpreting domestic legislation. Um, unfortunately, I think our experiences of judicial reviews in the high court are oh, that it really isn't it, it isn't that strong or as strong as disabled people would like which is why we're campaigning for the convention to be enshrined in domestic legislation it was the case that all of the mainstream opposition parties uh, had pledged that they would uh, enshrine it in domestic legislation if elected labor's got bit hazy on that lately so we're not exactly sure uh, where they stand on that. Um, if you're a state party signed up to the convention you're routinely examined every five years um, supposedly. Covid has meant that the committee has got a real backlog. They have a um, huge number of countries to uh, examine so they, they are behind. The form that that routine examination will take is they invite evidence from civil society, from human rights commissions who are independent of government, and then the, the government or state party itself. They will take written evidence, and then there's a public examination session in Geneva itself. In terms of the civil society reporting, another reason why the convention is so important among disabled campaigners here is because um, under the, this convention, it is the, the committee has made clear in something they call a general comment. General comments are uh, documents that are put out that explain how the committee interprets different articles. General comment number seven makes clear that for civil society reporting, it needs to be led by deaf and disabled people in our organisations. So not non-user led charities. This is the only space that we really have where it has to be our voice and we're at the forefront and the big well-resourced non-user led charities uh, aren't allowed, aren't allowed to, to come in and, and push us out. So that's another reason why it's, it's so important to us. And we have set up something we call the UK Coalition. It has a longer title than that. It's actually the UK Deaf and Disabled People's Organisations Convention on the Rights of Disabled People's Monitoring Coalition. Um, but we're made up of deaf and disabled people's organisations across the UK. And we work together on agreeing the shared points, the shared messaging and what goes in to our reports. It is very, very challenging reporting within a devolution context. I know the committee finds it very, very difficult because of course different legislation and different policies apply to different areas. Um, you know, it, it, you can't 
you can't set sort of like blanket ways of understanding it. You just have to explain policy or legislation by legislation. Well, this applies to this number of countries and this to this. It, it's, it's very complicated. Um, one of the most notable things about the convention in recent times has been the unprecedented special investigation that campaign group I'm involved with, Disabled People Against Cuts, DPAC, we triggered a special investigation under the optional protocol. So up until then, that had only been used by individuals alleging that their rights had been breached under the, the convention. We used the optional protocol to allege there were grave and systematic violations of disabled people's rights occurring. Um, it took a lot of evidence to convince the committee to investigate. They'd never done this before and they, they didn't actually have a procedure worked out for how to do it. So they're kind of learning as they went along. But the amount of evidence from 2010 onwards um, became such that they couldn't credibly not investigate. They carried out a very comprehensive investigation. They studied thousands of pages of documents, including or especially from um, Parliament's own select committees. Um, charities have put together and DDPOs, lots and lots of evidence reports, which the government had ignored. They came over and they met a couple of hundred people. It was a very comprehensive investigation and their finding that was published in it was I think the 6th of November 2016 was that the UK government was guilty of grave and systematic violations of disabled people's rights due to austerity and welfare reform and the three specific articles they looked at with the scope of that inquiry was article 19 which is a right to independent living and being included in the community. So the reason why that one um, was in focus was because of the massive social care cuts. Article 27 and a right to good work and Article 28 and a right to social protection and an adequate standard of living. And those two articles are very much sort of entwined within all of the changes to the social security system and things like conditionality for job searching and so on. And this was an unprecedented finding. Um, disabled people felt validated by it. They felt finally that they were being listened to, but the government, of course, dismissed it. Um, they described it as out, an, based on an outdated and patronising view of disability. Uh, they also tried to discredit it. They put something in the mail on Sunday, the day before it came out, trying to discredit one of the members of the committee, which I think the, the UN Disability Committee were shocked about. Um, they, they hadn't realised quite what kind of a government we have, I think. In 2017, they then did a routine examination under articles. And again, the findings were very damning. The chair talked about social cuts that have caused human catastrophe. Um, and where we are to finish, where we're up to now is that the committee is very behind, as I said, they're not going to be able to do another routine examination until maybe a couple of years time. They wanted the government here to know that they are still very concerned and that they're keeping an eye. Um, so they have done a follow up to the special inquiry. And just to say the reason why they're so concerned, it's it's about the idea of progressive implementation. They're not saying that the situation for disabled people in the UK is worse than in other countries around the world. That's pertinently not the case where you know countries don't have a disability benefit system at all. The issue is about deliberate retrogression in a very systematic and calculated way. Retrogression of disabled people's rights and entitlements. With the special inquiry, deaf and disabled people's organisations sent a very long report. We sent that in August for their committee's follow up. We also went to give evidence in Geneva. Um, the government didn't show up because they said they were they were too busy. They were they weren't ready. They weren't ready. So they said they'd come in March instead. 
So they're meant to be turning up on the 18th of March to give evidence in the afternoon. It will be on UN TV from, from 3 to 4.30. Um, and a large delegation of deaf and disabled people will be going out um, to make sure that they are <laughs> they are watched while they're giving their evidence. They don't get away with going um, without us there. We're gonna we're gonna be there, and people will be watching from home and scrutinising what they say. Um, as many people know, the government does you spin and misuse statistics uh, the uk stats authority are always pulling them up on things but actually a lot of disabled people since 2010 have become quite expert in knowing the stats and the figures and the policies and are able to pick up um where there is where there are inaccuracies so that's we will be scrutinizing what they say to look for gaps in the information and inaccuracies um, I was just, if I'm allowed, just going to quickly say a couple of things about why I think it's important to be aware of the convention um, and to follow what's happening. I mean, it's clear the United Nations are very, very upset with the with the UK government. They think what they're doing is absolutely shocking. I think it is. When rapporteurs from the United Nations, like the housing rapporteur or the extreme poverty rapporteur have come over. Um, I know the extreme poverty rapporteur, Philip Alston came in 2018. They've had quite a lot of media coverage for what they're saying. And that's because they set up specific press conferences. The committees don't work in that way. They have to be seen to be handling their dialogue with countries more diplomatically. So they can come out with quite strong statements about the UK, but there's not a lot of noise made about it in advance. So you have to be watching, you have to be following to know. Um, second point is that because there's so many things happening, it's so complicated in terms of things like social security policy that the written reports that deaf and disabled people's organizations put in are very, very comprehensive. Because the government dismisses everything it possibly can, we make sure that they are assiduously referenced. And we also include comments and case studies. So if there are particular areas of policy, such as you know within social care or, or benefits, then our reports are a really good place to go to pick up um most recent statistics and also how people are feeling about things and deaf and disabled people's organizations because we're run and controlled by ourselves we're more in touch with the grassroots so i know i often have phone calls from journalists looking for, for case studies we're in much we find it much easier to get people to share their stories um because those people are us um and thirdly, I just I suppose I wanted to make a point about social cohesion. Like I said, disabled people don't feel that the media reflects the issues that are important to us and doesn't reflect a an image of disability which is progressive and helpful. And I think it's a it's a trend in society. We know people feeling alienated. I'm definitely all for radical campaigning that's what my life is about um but i am very aware of the dangers of where people feel alienated but they don't have uh, an immediate place they know where they can go um to to campaign to get an analysis uh, and i just know for example that in the 2015 general election in the run-up when disabled people didn't feel there was any political party that represented us our main job was telling people that voting for UKIP wasn't in the best interest of disabled people because it was so there were such huge numbers of disabled people that felt that was the only place to go. And I, I think where I think the media has a role in that is where la language doesn't reflect the language we use, where our issues aren't covered. It just increases that sense of, of division in society uh, and that we're not included. And I'm going to finish. Thank you. <laughs>
Thank you. Thank you ever so much, Ellen. That was a really comprehensive um, overview. Um, probably people are still uh, processing quite a lot of that information. Um, uh, on the last point around the media, um, it's worth um, me pointing out that the NUJ had long campaigned um, you know, for IPSO, which is the um, regulator, one of the regulators in the newspaper industry. We've campaigned for their editor's code the clause on discrimination to be extended to include discrimination against groups. So at the moment, you can only make a complaint to IPSO if an individual disabled person has been discriminated against in an article, um, whereas most of the problematic reporting that we see is discriminatory and negative about disabled people as a group. So we, we continue to campaign on that, and we have members who've challenged um negative pieces that they've seen and they've been able to um get wins from ipso um much to our surprise actually um Anne is going to start off with um uh, two or three questions for you and we'll also open up to questions from um everybody else so feel free to put them in the chat or, or put your put your hands up and i'll i'll come to you so Anne, over to you um, thank you, Ellen and Natasha. Always a pleasure to work with you both and to support the work of the delegation in raising awareness of disabled people's issues. I'm going to begin the Q&A section with three questions based on queries members have raised with us. Um, how can journalists use a social model approach when writing? I mean, you, you made very clear what the social approach, um, social model approach was, but how can we um, for journalists who are on the learning curve about what it might be that would be really you know tips and things and then um how can journalists scrutinize the uk governments and the department of work and pensions claims instead of just repeating them because we know that in many newsrooms people are just under huge pressure so it's how can we in a way it's how can we support the journalists to actually have the, the signpost them to where to look for you know what might be going on and then finally as journalists it can be difficult to know how to report disabled people's personal stories because the system in which these stories are unfolding is so very complex especially if we don't have pre-existing or deep knowledge of how the benefit system works um, and also because when dealing with traumatized people it can be difficult to get coherent information um, sometimes that is not always, and so that it's more difficult for us as journalists to ensure that the reporting is accurate. Do you have any advice for journalists on these points? Thank you, Ellen. Thanks, Annie. So with the social model approach, I mentioned language, so I'm going to repeat that because it is so important to us to use our language. So disabled people. <laughs> Um, and, and I know that the NUJ, I think, has got um, documents on the correct language to use. The other one that upsets a lot of disabled people is when we're continually called vulnerable, um, because we don't find that very helpful, um, because often it's society, it's society that's making us vulnerable through particular policies. The idea that we're inherently vulnerable is quite dangerous because it leads to issues that could be resolved uh, being neglected. I'm thinking in policing, for example, where hate crime isn't picked up as hate crime, it's just passed off as vulnerable, per, you know, vulnerable persons issue. The other thing is the pity model of disability, um, which is still all pervasive in society and is one of the reasons why we have tensions with the charities who, through their, their fundraising, play on the idea of how terrible it is to be disabled. Um, we find that extremely unhelpful because it, it others us and it acts against our inclusion in society. What we want is attention to issues which are making our lives difficult, which are violating our rights, which are social uh, examples of social injustice. Uh, and we want the focus to be on those things as bad, not the focus on us as bad and how how bad our, you know it is to be disabled. Um, and 
we don't feel that a, a lot of coverage really um, re really uh, comes across in the way in the way that we want. There is a difficulty in that because that model, that pity model of disability is so entrenched within society. I know that people talk about, you know, hearts and minds of readers and getting them interested. Um, and that is, it, it's a formula which well known, the kind of old poor disabled person. And if you don't use that, uh, it can then be difficult to get interest in disability issues. So I don't necessarily have the solutions to that. But what we would very much like is the focus to be on the issues as the bad thing. Uh, and, and for this idea that it's terrible to be disabled for, for that to be kind of left aside. Um, and a focus on our impairments. I know in, in kind of describing people in the media, um, but we really, a social model approach is not to look and scrutinize what our impairments are. Um, people tend to be very interested in that and really that's not of interest, what should be of interest um, of the social injustices that are happening to us. Um, on the second question about scrutinizing the government, it's really, yeah, and so right about how frustrating it is where you see things the government have come out with repeated as fact, whereas they're not fact, they're a spin quite often. They can be a misuse of statistics, but it takes someone to complain and then for the UK Stats Authority to come and slap their wrists and then there'll be a correction or an apology and whoever sees that, you know, nobody won't meanwhile, uh, a, a mistruth has been has been put out there. Um, so I would say to always be suspicious and questioning, like, like Anne says, of anything that purports to be um, a fact. One, one thing I can think of that's quite easy to look out for is whenever they talk about things not affecting people on disability benefits, that doesn't mean they don't affect disabled people. And we've seen that with, for example, the benefit freeze and also the benefit cap. Um, I've even seen journalists talk about sanctions um, as not uh, not being applicable to disabled people, we, and, and none of that's true. Disabled people are affected by all those things, but what sometimes um, is the case, or was the case with the with the benefit freeze, for example, was that disability specific benefits were exempt for the freeze, but there were other standard allowances that disabled got disabled people get, so they were affected by that. Um, the example I gave about sanctions, so that was actually in an article that was um, looking at a report that the DWP had slipped out, looking into the employment outcomes of sanctions. And within that report, they hadn't talked about disabled claimants. They, they talked, the DWP used the phrase claimants on a health journey in that. And this journalist had just read that and not thought and not questioned. There was actually a footnote, very small footnote, that explained what they meant in the report by claimants on a health journey. And I know people are busy, um, uh, but it, <laughs> this is an area where it does pay to scrutinise because the government doesn't want awareness for what they're doing to disabled people. So it's an area where they do spin and they will do things like that. So I think just being aware um, that this is an issue where it's important to scrutinise. And thirdly, around the personal stories. So I would advise to go through deaf and disabled people's organisations because um, organ those organisations can support people to share their case studies um, so that they can, yeah, they, they talk to the individual. They can then be, if you like, an intermediary to make sure that you're able to get the most important information for the story. But they will also have the understanding of the how the system works, because like Annie says, it's both social care and the social security system are extremely complicated and convoluted. And particularly in social security, the language that's used is deliberately unnecessarily jargony. I would say deliberately so that you can't easily do media sound bites on it or explain it. Um, so getting DDPOs to help you understand um, the system. When, when the, in terms of the context, um, it's really important to remember that 
we face barriers in every single direction that we turn in, um, you know, whether it's accessing transport, um, accessible housing, um, education and employment opportunities, every single direction we turn in, there are barriers that prevent us from um, having full control of how we live our lives, from having full access to the same opportunities that anybody else can take for granted. Um, and so often the discussion does get boiled down to the social security system. But, but actually the reason that we need social security is because we don't have access to all of these other things that um, everybody else can just just expect that they're entitled to we have the same rights and that isn't recognized it isn't respected and we have a government that is quite happy to be very hostile towards disabled people knowing that that's going to be replicated and then consumed by the general public and that reinforces the hostility that we experience in our day-to-day -day lives when we step out of our homes you know um so so i think that context is really important when we're thinking about the narrative that comes from government that is deliberately oppressive towards disabled people they're already in the midst of one anyway um yeah. and i think yeah that they are just ramping it up it's interesting like you say they've done that ahead of geneva so it strikes me that they're possibly trying to preemptively discredit the findings of the committee um by stirring up you know, a basis of opinion, which is that, you know, we're, we're, we're making all of this up. We were already extremely concerned about the way, about the changes to social security, which have been coming in and announced since March 2023, which were already taking a whole new level of assault on uh, disabled people. And, and the model of disability, I'm not going to get technical on it, but the whole of welfare reform is underpinned by what we call the bio, the bios, a form of the biopsychosocial model, um, which essentially is about denying disability. And, and that has never gone away. That's That's been underpinning it before. And I think it's just ramping up now. I think the government saw what they can get away with against disabled people during COVID. Um, so they're going for it now. They are trying to push through things that they couldn't get away with before COVID in terms of taking away um, disability benefits support. With the changes in the white paper, they're quite clearly heading towards a direction where hundreds and thousands, if not millions of disabled people who currently get extra out of work benefits for being disabled will no longer be entitled to those they want us just to be on that um that basic job seekers allowance level which we know is specifically designed to be so low you can only live on it for a very short amount of time realistically you know many of us won't fit in the workplace and it's particularly people um like myself who live with mental distress or people with neurodivergence we find it most difficult to fit into into the workplace so surprise surprise we're the ones that they are going for the government has never had any evidence base underpinning um their welfare reform program the claims they make that justify it for example that by doing this they're getting more people into work claims that by taking away our benefits we'll be freed from the trap of poverty because we'll suddenly find work this idea that these conditions aren't real there's i mean you know matthew paris just spouting out opinion is one thing but the dwp never has any evidence base they never cross-reference with health data for example which would prove that there are many people who um who are too in too much pain um or distress to be able to work i do feel that disabled people are in a phase now where we're facing an existential threat i think it's that bad I am very concerned. I was already going to Geneva with concerns and I'm even more worried now. Thank you, John. <laughs> the, uh, the, the only one that comes to mind immediately, I think, and it's really difficult, I haven't found a way to explain it easily, is the one from that report I mentioned that was the, uh, the DWP's analysis or evaluation of the employment outcomes of um, people who've been sanctioned. 
Right. The overall finding of the report is that sanctioning pushes those who've been sanctioned away from employment. So there's a small negative finding, but their mm. justification is that having sanctioning means that the overall caseload are moving further towards employment without an evidence base for that. Um, I think that's strange. <laughs> um, uh, but within that, the finding that really concerns me is that for disabled claimants who've been sanctioned, they are twice as likely as a non-disabled claimant to be pushed out of the benefit system and then not picked up in HMRC data. So they're not going on to like a salary job. Um, or you know self-employment where they earn enough to pay taxes and that's not an easy thing to explain but I, that that has never been picked up anywhere and that concerns me but I, I think it's worth looking through um, our reports that we put out I mean the other mm -hmm. thing I'm aware of is that with in work conditionality um, I think the only equality impact assessment I've ever seen um, on I think it was in work progression and they reckoned only one percent of the caseload affected by that would be disabled but other data they've got on the future cohort study shows that 27 percent of those affected by in work conditionality would be disabled people uh, and Unite's picked that up and done a big campaign on that and I, I think usually with most areas of social policy disabled people are overrepresented um, within it and I think just always being aware of that so for example carers the majority of carers are disabled people um, mm. lone parents disability is a major factor in that whether it's the um, the single parent who's disabled or the child disability is is overrepresented everywhere so I think just looking out for that <laughs> just to say in terms of the reports that we sent to mm -hmm. the um, committee all the ones that are publicly available are on the Inclusion London website. It's inclusionlondon.org.uk, I think. In my understanding, it's all deaf and disabled. Well, it's definitely all deaf and disabled people's organisations. And I think all charities now use the phrase disabled people. Um, we see it as a political term disabled as a, a political term referring yeah. to oppression and because some people don't identify as having a disability so for example um, certain understandings trauma-informed understandings and mental distress or neurodivergence isn't a disability so um, in order to create that that umbrella that we all come under we focus on the oppression so I um, I, I remember in the mid 1990s I think I, I actually trained to work with the National Autistic Society then and we were told to say people with disabilities to put the person first but then as soon as I became politically involved we were told disabled people and I think that now is the the understanding and, and the conservative government uses disabled people all the time and they are very good at knowing what they should say <laughs> um so that they can um kind of subvert our language so so I would I would say I'd, I'd I think definitely disabled people. I think there is confusion because disabled people's own ideas and our own thoughts on on, on ourselves are not well known in society because we because we're still so marginalised and excluded. It means there's confusion. It's, yeah, it's, it's worth thinking. You know, individual disabled people might define themselves in different ways. Yeah, that's um, true. And as a journalist, you know, we we would want to respect that, but um, uh, it's using the word disabled in a way that we're not used to in everyday language that I think trips people up. So if you think about it, instead of people with impairments and health conditions, instead of people with disabilities, that's what we're really saying. And then when we say disabled people, we're referring to that ableism and oppression and those systemic barriers that disable us, that take away our ability to do the things that we are perfectly capable of doing in our day-to-day -day life. It, it just takes a bit of getting used to the language um, and then then it kind of starts to flow in the end when you get used to it. Um, and and just to kind of wrap up on Siobhan's question, um, which is uh, one that we think about all the time in the disability movement, which is how do we mobilize all of those disabled people in the UK? 
and um, those people who have internalized ableism, who don't know what their rights are, who have um, grown up being conditioned by uh, a paternalistic society that treats disabled people as if we, you know, are passive recipients of care and can't do anything for ourselves. Um, it's, it's a really big question, uh, I think, for all of us, and this is where our colleagues in the NUJ and our allies across the trade union movement are really important to us because the way that we write about disabled people and disability equality issues impacts on people's perceptions of us. Um, and we can empower disabled people or we can continue to oppress them by the way that we write about them, report on them um, and talk about them. I say them, us, um, because I am a disabled person myself. Um, any, any other sort of final thoughts from, from you, Alan? I would encourage people to find out about disabled people against cuts. We're kind of the, the we don't just do street protests, actually. We, we triggered the, the inquiry under the convention, for example. Um, but I think that, that street protests are a very important part of the movement because they give people hope. They give people something to get involved in. Even if you can't come and join, you can support um, on Twitter. I think we've got a lot of these things in place now since 2010, like Disability News Service I saw mentioned, which is brilliant, of course. Um, DPAC. We've now got the UK Coalition. So we've got deaf and disabled people's organisations campaigning on the shared issues from the Westminster government together. I, I think we're, we're getting stronger in lots of ways, but it's, it's just more people finding out about the things that exist and telling people word of mouth. Brilliant. Thank you. So um, sorry for running over time, but it has been such a fascinating discussion. I could easily go on for hours, but I won't. Um, so thank you so much, Alan, for your time today, for sharing your expertise and answering all the questions. And thank you, Anne, also for, for you helping to organise and being here today and everybody else who helped to organise and promote it. Um, we will um, send out some links and resources to those of you who signed up. But feel free to get in touch if you've got any particular questions that we can follow up on. And please do um, um, uh, go to the Inclusion London website for more information. Um, follow the Twitter list of disabled people's organisations um, and please help to amplify uh, the messages that we're sharing over the next few days and weeks. Uh, so thank you every, ever so much, everybody, and take care. Have a good evening. <laughs>